much. You know, we have a special relationship with the Calandra Italian American Institute. I'm so sorry, Anthony's not here. Anthony, if you can see us, you know, um, we, we miss you. Um, but this is always your casa. As you know, Dr. Tamburi was uh, our uh, head of the department uh, and, and head of the uh, Italian program, and then became our associate dean here in the College of Arts and Letters before he went off to, to New York or back to New York. So we miss him, but he's so loyal coming back every year with his colleagues to make sure that this is a special event. So thank you. This year, Ilaria always has something new and special. There's so many interesting things that are gonna happen this year. But I do want to thank those who have opened their homes to our travelers who came from so far. Um, what a wonderful, usually we have, you know, we put them in hotels, but what a warm, wonderful thing that you're doing to welcome our speakers. Uh, thank you so much for opening your homes for these folks. Um, the generosity of the Italian community, Italian American community just never ends. Um, and so you're going to hear that Mark Fasanella um, whose father, I believe, was a very famous painter, Ralph Bassanella. You see the books here. He's brought these books and is, is selling them. They're beautiful art books. Um, but guess what? The proceeds are coming to a scholarship here at FAU. So thank you. I don't know if Ms. Bassanella is here. Oh, <laughs> thank you for that generosity. Um, your, your father's work is just blows my mind when I just got a chance to look through it. Um, I hope all of you will get a, take a book home uh, uh, with you. So thank you so much. And then the special guests, uh, we always give the award of who came from the farthest, right? So this year it's Greta Skolason from Iceland. <laughs> Iceland, there we are. Um, but uh, I'm not sure about geography. So Marco Bofanti and Anna Godano from Italy, there we are all the way from Italy. I'm not sure which is farther, Iceland or Italy. And then Mark Fasanella from New York, thank you. And then you're in for a treat tomorrow. I'm not gonna spoil the treat, but Ilaria will be well, giving a, a research lecture on this amazing family, the Zoppe Circus family from Italy and the United States. And um, if you like circuses, you're in for a treat tomorrow, not just the history, history that Ilaria will be telling uh, the, uh, from her research of this be beautiful family story, but uh, some of the Sope family will be here. So that's tomorrow afternoon. I'm looking forward to that myself. Um, so I, without further ado, I'm gonna give the program back to Ilaria. Thank you for coming out. You're always welcome here in the College of Arts and Letters. We have wonderful programs uh, like this and always open to the public. And to the students, you're in for a treat. Lots of learning to happen this weekend. Thank you, Ilaria. Thank you. This was a, such a nice uh, presentation from the father here of our, <laughs> of our college. So now I give the word to Eva Alvino, Vice Consul General of Italy in Miami. Well, welcome to FAU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dean, and thank you, Professor Sarah, for renewing this invitation to this yearly rendezvous. Um, it is a pleasure for me to take part in this uh, sixth international symposium. Um, and sin since the successful events are always an output of a common effort, uh, let me again extend my appreciation to Audley and to the Il Circolo Italian Cultural Society that's represented today too. Uh, these are, you know, uh, partners with which we work uh, every day and for many years also. Um, this professional and academic meeting has become an important moment for sharing teaching uh, researches and interests among the Italian scholars community. But to what is my understanding, because me too, I'm new in Florida, uh, it is also so much more thanks to uh, the Italian program here at FAU and to the collaboration with uh, the Calandra Italian American Institute in New York. Italian Transit is also a gathering of uh, a space where cross-cultural encounters are shaped. And testimonials, ideas, collaborations that I've seen in the program um, underlying two aspects that are very you know, dear to me, the fascinating nature of our language, the possibility for us to analyze it and to discover something new over and over, and also the defining role that our language has to the community living abroad. Uh, living abroad. So promoting our language to us uh, is not something we should take for granted. It takes dedication, passion, and love for our country. 
So FAU provides Italian courses, multidisciplinary approach, and it's not just language and culture, is cinema maybe, is um, uh, creative writing, is culture. We could not uh, you know, wish for a more comprehensive approach to our language. So thank you very much. And this is a project that we support and treasure also. So language and culture uh, as a diplomat are, are crucial also in strengthening and fostering uh, the bonds between two communities and two countries. I do believe that the connection between Italy and the United States is therefore nourished by uh, events like Italy in transit. And this symposium, many days together, is a unique occasion to, cher sharing, uh, to cherish on one side a year-long effort in promoting Italian language, but it's also something that makes fun, brings us together and uh, keep us together. So as a Deputy Consul General of Italy in Miami, I'm really honored to kick off this symposium today. So thank you very much for having me today. <laughs> Thank you, very beautiful speech. So now we're going to try our first uh, panelist, uh, who is uh, Magda Novelli. And Magda is the um, president of the Organization per la Diffusione della Lingua Italiana for the diffusion of the Italian language. She's in Miami, and tomorrow she'll be here in the morning. So she will just give the greetings now on, online. This is our first attempt to webinar, so it should be working. Okay, perfecto. Shall we make this bigger? Magda, puoi parlare. Yes, sono qui. Aspetta, aspetta. Lo so che non mi vedi. Ah, okay. Okay, you should give me permission to start the video. Permission to start a video. Ok, grazie che me l'hai detto. Uh, come si fa? Questa è una cosa nuova. Un toto. Per adesso... Oh, if you can make me co-host, maybe. Se adesso mi stai chiedendo cose difficilissime. Make ok, make co-host. Yes. Ok, and I should be able, let's see... Yes, I go me. Ciao. It seems like I'm so far away, but no, I'm in Miami in reality. So ciao, ciao Ilaria. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to come tomorrow. I cannot wait to be with you and with all the FAO friends. So I just want to say briefly that uh, right now I'm here in my role as Executive Director of ODLI, Organization for the Diffusione della Lingua Italiana. So it's a non-profit organization that promotes the Italian culture and language in K-12 schools in Florida and also, God willing, somewhere else soon. So <laughs> In your county, we promoted and we started, thanks to the collaboration also with the Italian consulate, of course, two Italian programs from scratch, as you know, no? And in the future, we will have others. Oddly, recently, it's very into and involved in everything about sustainability. As you know, Italian, Italy as a country is fighting for the environment. And as long as our government, we want to fight for it as well. So as you can see behind me, save the date and declare your love for the environment, Saturday, <laughs> February 19 at FAU Biscayne Bay campus, help us to clean the beach from the plastic. So we wait for you. I'll talk about it a little bit more, maybe tomorrow. Meantime, enjoy. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to attend all these wonderful presenters and presentations. And ci vediamo live domani, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. No, 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 no.
on the food. No, 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 no. no, no. Hmm? Oops, <laughs> sorry. Come si fa questa cosa? Okay. Forse participants. Adesso impariamo. Impariamo. No. Guarda se c'è la lista qua. Non c'è più? Sono tutti, no. Sono questi. Caspita, abbiamo imparato come dare il... Eh, ma non come toglierlo. Ok, maybe I have to talk... I... Ok, now? Ok. No, Better. però adesso... No. Cosa dobbiamo Sarà fare? Cos'è il nostro non si No, ricordi? No. Zach, ci aiuti tu? Dobbiamo essere nella lista. Lei deve essere nella lista. Prima, prima era, ma adesso non più. Ah, ah ecco ah. perché è diventato così. Primo. Ok, probabilmente se abbiamo riuscito. Okay. E adesso però come si fa? Adesso dobbiamo andare sempre su tutti i miei. No. No. Ok. Dovremmo esserci. Sì, 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 sì. Share screen, ok. Bene, we have the last greeting for today, which is Gloria Ciongoli del Circolo. And uh, exactly, this was the little seed that was put in the ground uh, more than 35 years ago and uh, grew to become what we are now. So Gloria, you need to start this symposium with your presence. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Because I could hardly hear what was being said before, but <clears throat> I sing in church and so I can get very loud. <laughs> But um, uh, most of what I was going to say has already been said. Uh, Il Circolo in 1986 gave the first contribution that started the Italian Studies program here at FAU. And we're very proud of that. And we're so proud to be uh, members of the group of supporters that they've had over the years. And since then, we've underwritten the Semesters Abroad program that Professora Ilaria Serras takes a group of students every summer you did for many years until COVID. And we were able to underwrite that uh, by raising funds for the program. And on uh, March the 13th, we will be having our fundraising gala at the Breakers Hotel in Palm Beach. And we're praying that we raise a tremendous amount of money so that we continue uh, supporting the program. And finally, I really wanted to thank Michael, uh, uh, Dean Michael Horswell for uh, insisting that the program be strengthened and expanded. And now it has become one of the premier uh, Italian studies programs in the state of Florida. So bravo to you and to uh, Dean Horswell. Thank you. Okay, so. Now we're ready for the presentations uh, and for the heart of this afternoon. We have two wonderful presentations, actually two and a half because Sandra uh, was uh, so kind to help us and give us uh, a more complete uh, explanation of uh, uh, Tom Di Salvo. And uh, since uh, our Anthony Tamburri cannot be here, we're going directly to uh, Domenica and her presentation Project protecting and projecting the family image in paintings of Tom Di Salvo and Ralph Fasanella. So she will have a comparative approach to the very interesting, two very interesting painters. And you will also notice that Tom Di Salvo is going to be our friend for the entire program. So we are going to see him today. And then this afternoon, we welcome you to see the Kandinsky Chronicles uh, in the Art and Letters building. And tomorrow we will have our lunch all together at the Ritter Art Gallery, uh, where there are also two of his paintings that Dominic and Viviana have helped uh, uh, to uh, show. So it's going to be with us. And this is good because uh, Anthony, uh, Anthony Tom was a good friend of ours when he was here alive with us. So now we stop share this and uh, you need your PowerPoint and it's here. Tom uh, Okay. 
Okay, Domenica Di, Re Di Re Ravium is a PhD student of Florida Atlantic University. She's working now, she's ABD. She finished all her coursework and her exams and is now writing her dissertation on Tom DiSalvo. And she's also a teacher for us and she works at the Broward College as an IT uh, expert. It's incredible. So thank you very much, Domenica. And I leave her the word. <laughs> I pulled out of my slideshow. Oh, uh, so, uh, just to be in the slideshow, do you want to click here? There we go. Very well. So, thank you, Eladia. And um, thank you, everyone. I am honored actually to be a part of Italy in Transit. And I've been a part of the Italy in Transit Symposium since, the, since its inception six years ago. Uh, so this afternoon, I am glad that you have me here and I would like to share with you an aspect of my research on the art of Tom DeSalvo. And for those of you who don't know, Tom DeSalvo was a beloved Sicilian American and a South Florida artist who was also very much involved in the Italian American community and Italian studies at FAU. Uh, throughout the symposium, as Ilaria has already mentioned, you will get to enjoy his paintings that are exhibited throughout our beautiful campus. A feature uh, that recurs in Tom's art is the combination of visual and textual elements. And Sandra Curtis will be speaking after me uh, momentarily. But in the meantime, I would like to begin by proposing a discussion on the theme of family in the Italian American tradition through a comparative assessment of Tom DeSalvo's 1994 work entitled Family and Ralph Fasanella's 1972 painting, The Family Supper. I'm especially thankful today that I am sharing this small part of my research with members of the Fasanella family and also the DeSalvo family. And they have both been very, very supportive and invaluable con uh, contributors to my research and my understanding of these works. The goal of my research is to establish Tom DeSalvo as a, and his artistic legacy within the field of Italian American studies for those such as those who are established uh, Sicilian, Italian and Italian American authors, poets, artists and critics through the observed relationships between similar themes and techniques. And throughout this process, I'm also striving to incorporate this work, his work into the Italian language curriculum through my dedication to public digital humanities. There we go. Uh, let me see. Uh, can I, yeah, if I could just move this down here. I don't know where to put it. I guess over here is okay for now. Here we go. So family is an assemblage of acrylic and photographs that are affixed to a 27 inch diameter. Um, it, it's a 27 inch circular diameter plaque that represents the DeSalvo family dynamic in the early 1990s. The four brothers surround their disproportionately larger mother Rosa and the viewer understands immediately as Will Parinello points out in his documentary, Little Italy, that although the husband is the authority figure, the wife is the power figure. And Tom supports his mom, positioning himself as Rosa's closest confidant and partner as the two bake pizzas and bread and traditional Sicilian sweets. Meanwhile, Pat, Jack, and Pete DeSalvo are engaged in the Italian art producing the FPD family brand of wine. The family moves in three directions. The linear motion guides the son's interactions with their father and the triangular arrangement of the overall work as well as its component parts creates unity within the design and the family dynamic. Simultaneously, all of the actions radiate outwards, stopping at a contrasting border. The son's proximity to their parents and their limiting boundary illustrate the Sicilian maxim that we read about in Jerry Mangione's memoir, Mount Allegro that a son stuck by his family, leaving only to marry, and even then the expectation was that he would return to raise his children in the presence of their grandparents. And in fact, we see the grandchildren and the daughters-in-law are displayed in photographs on the mantle. And I tried to take the details of the picture and kind of pull it out into um, separate spaces for you to, to appreciate the smaller details. The theme of the work is abundance and gratitude, a modern day allegory of the biblical miracles at Cana and Capernaum, 
Wine is literally overflowing and there is a bounty of breads. Growing up in Italy, annual rituals of winemaking, canning and baking were built into the agricultural calendar as a time for work, but also as an important time for storytelling. Memories from those experiences relocated in an American backyard setting are knit into the fabric of poems, essays, and memoirs, such as those collected by Edvita Junta and Luis de Salvo in their anthology, The Milk of Almonds. Embedded within this composition of exuberant family members, there is also a sentimental reference to the family's lean years. Schiacciando. Oh, no, 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 the no, 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 Built by Pasquale di Salvo before World War II, it provided sustenance to the family as Gelsomina, the paternal grandmother, bartered its use with the locals in exchange for bread and also sold her baked goods as a means of survival during, the period, during their period as Sfollati. The matriarch's entrepreneurial mindset and community ties staved off famine during the war. By the 1990s, each of the DeSalvo family members has become a naturalized citizen and adopted American names and practices, such as using the electric stove without abandoning their ancestral traditions of the wood burning oven. Here. From which the flames blaze above Mother Rosa's head, adorning her with Lady Liberty's crown or an angelic halo of the Italian Renaissance, or perhaps a penitential crown of thorns. Each one equally a metaphor that links Rosa, Rosa di Salvo to her migration experience. Whether she is viewed as a, as a freedom, um, as a beacon of freedom or a cherubim or a martyr, she happily continues baking with the primary ingredient, unbleached forever flour, that is yet another affirmation of di Salvo's commitment to adhering to their roots. The DeSalvo family members' personalities resonate within their facial expressions and their symbolic attire. The parents, Paul and Rosa, wear red, a color associated with life, health, and vigor. Pete, the youngest, proclaims his American birth in his yellow Milwaukee Kid t-shirt, the color of optimism and well-being. Jack's affiliation with the armed forces is displayed in his light blue t-shirt with the B-12 across his chest. And Pat's dollar sign imprinted orange attire designates his profession as a CPA, as well as his dynamic and assertive nature. Tom is distinguished in a more formal polo shirt that celebrates his alma mater, the University of Chicago, in the color of peace and gentleness that accurately describes his disposition. The artist's choice of combining realistic photos on a painted background solders personal reality with, an idealized, with the idealized memories of a family that is living out both the Italian and American dream. In the outer band, the artist has stenciled the second verse of the sacred Tantum Ergo, a Latin blessing recited during the benediction of the sacrament during Catholic masses. And I have it here both in the Latin as well as the English translation. In an interview, Tom's friend and fellow peer of classical studies, Vincent Zarilli, noted how appropriately this blessing ties in with Rosa's religious devotion and Tom's experience in the role of altar boy and seminarian. This prayer provides physical and spiritual protection for the family and adds an oral component to this work. Notwithstanding the abundance of religious imagery on this, in this composition, family members comment on its secular context. To them, it represents an aspect of a bygone era altered by the variables of American lifestyles. Um, I really want you to see this quote. Uh, there you go. Okay. Here you go. So on to um, a comparison with Ralph Fasanella's work. You may agree that there are compelling comparisons between the Salvo's composition family and Ralph Fasanella's painting, The Family Supper from 1972. Each is a microcosm of the respective artist's Italian immigrant experience. 
Both artists are self-taught painters of shared Southern Italian heritage. Both experienced intense, albeit divergent relations with the Catholic church that ultimately distanced them as practicing Catholics, but forged a lasting imprint on their art. Comparatively, both the family and the family supper propose that no matter how meager, the family home is a figurative place of worship and the family meal is a metaphorical Eucharist. This is a common perception among Italian American authors and it's beautifully narrated in this excerpt from Richard Gambino's Blood of My Blood that I have up on the screen right now. Each artist's message is relatable beyond the canvas. While Fasanella encompasses the entire community within his framework, in fact, the brickwork is the surrounding tenement buildings that frames the action, DeSalvo limits outsider engagement. Fasanella's nondescript figures animating the windows and streets contrast with the photographic visages that animate DeSalvo's composition. However, according to Ralph Fasanella's biographer, Patrick Watson, even in their anonymity, the characters bustling outside of the Fasanella tenement apartment were unique and discernible to him. I propose that these characters include his version of Jeremio and Annunziata di Donato's tenement neighbors, the Malovs and the Olsons from Pietro di Donato's narrative, Christ in Concrete. Even the tragic present of Di presence of Di Donato's anthropomorphic antagonist, Job, inhabits the Fasanella dwelling in the crucified effigy of his father enthroned by the tools of his trade. Ralph's mother, Ginevra, embodies the living sacrificial maternal figure branded the Madonna of the Clothesline by Pellegrino di Asierno in his essay from Stella to Stella. Reference to the medieval image of the Madonna is a recurring theme in both Fasanella and Di Salvo's interpretation of motherhood. And while they show deference to their fathers, placing them in the upper right of the canvas, the matriarchal relationship is the focal point of these works. The Family Supper illustrates the coming of age experiences of the children at the end of the Great Migration and illustrates the narrative of Alberto Pecorino's The Children of Immigrants, whereas Di Salvo's assemblage, The Family, resonates with the visual expectations of children of immigrants who yearn to navigate contrasting social and cultural environments. It is, character, it is in its characterized qualities that it conveys a universal ethnic appeal of the Italian American family dynamic that was popularized in the 90s in the television sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond. The gap in the timeline between Fasanella and DiSalvo's settings was an era of relocation and social mobility for Italian Americans who dispersed into suburbia and traded public spaces for more private ones. DiSalvo's family portrait depicts an inward move retreating from the neighborhood stoop and fire escapes to the single family home, wherein the circle of reliance and trust is diminished and individual merit is exalted. While Fasanella's extension of city blocks of tenement buildings reaches to the vanishing point and lends to the extensive community network, De Salvo's personal microcosm re revolutionized campanilismo around the sound of the oven timer. Bricks are replaced by words, and with that, the nobiltà di lavoro, to quote Anthony Riccio's upcoming book, shifts from manual labor to academic credentials. In either case, the ultimate objective is consistent with Gambino's premise that their ethos was rooted in the past and rather than relinquish it, it continues to shape their actions in their new environments. Both works confirm the ethnic rule that Italian behaviors in the home are distinct from the adapted Americanized behaviors beyond the threshold, a means of safeguarding the integrity of the cultural mores enmeshed in this bicultural um, dichotomy. Fasanella's narrative is nostalgic. A steamer trunk and ice tongs in the foreground and the image of his estranged father surveilling over the family immortalize the paternal sacrifice. The portrait of the artist's grandmother hanging on the far wall clings to the past. Di Salvo's interpretation is a communal celebration of Sicilian culinary traditions filled with laud and pride. The family is future facing drawing the eye upward toward the miniature photos 
that uh, adorning the mantle fringed by plants that loosely resemble the Trinacria, the Hellenic emblem of Sicily, but also represent the roots that connect the kin. The tiny photos of subsequent generations distinguish their moderated Sicilian pedigree, but does not exclude them from their inner protected circle. Although DeSalvo did not have any children of his own, he had close re a close relationship with his nieces and nephews. And each of those who were interviewed reminisced about outings in nature and appreciation for ancestral culture, philosophical conversations, fun games, and abundant feasts. In his college notebooks, DeSalvo authored a letter to son forecasting his paternal stance. And he declares to his future son that, quote, we are all in existence because of the drive and desire of two others, end quote. In the context of both of these works, the artists demonstrate that the existence and well-being of future generations transcends a mere biological urge, but is also strongly rooted in a steadfast tradition and drive and desire to preserve and enrich it. This point is true not only for the immigrants' resolution in, pro in propagating their family, but also in their sons, artists' conviction to memorialize the traits that their parents blazed, the trails that their parents blazed to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Before I pass the mic, um, let's try and make this a little bit smaller. I don't think I can. Uh, before I pass the mic to Sandra, I just wanted to close by dedicating my presentation to Anthony Vicho, who we met at Italy in Transit in 2020. And he became a fast family friend and an amazing mentor. And I really could stand and sing his praises all day long as an oral historian and an Italian American scholar, but I will simply say that it was his enthusiasm that encouraged me to wholeheartedly embrace my research topic. And he gave me the courage to curate the exhibits of DeSalvo's work and to reach out to Mark Fasanella as he had met Ralph Fasanella in the 80s. And, um, and, and so I, I just wanted to share a, a few of our memories and um, you only see Anthony in one picture because he was always behind the camera. And that's actually how I um, imagine him being right now, be behind the camera. And I, I hope that he rests in peace. Thank you. Nice, thank you, very nice. Um, especially for the memory of uh, Richo, that was a nice touch. And tomorrow we have a whole session dedicated to him. Um, so we're, he's also with us. Um, okay, so we have after the, the second uh, presentation here, uh, Sandra, we'll have uh, uh, Mark and then we'll have the questions from the audience. So uh, now Sandra, is a special guest. In fact, she's not in the, included in this program because we didn't know that she would be uh, so involved in this project. She has um, met us through the Italian club and uh, she came to one Gamma Kappa Alpha, the Italian Honor Society Research Day that we hold every semester. And, uh, and from that time, she completely uh, threw herself into the study of uh, the images of Tom DiSalvo who is really like a puzzle. It's very hard to understand and very hard to decipher. And here she will tell us how she does it. Thank you, Sandra. Ah, scusatemi, yes. I, I treat everybody as friends. So her last name is Sandra Curtis. <laughs> No. Okay. Start again. Press the button. Aspect everybody will share. All right? Share screen. Because we have a few people who are following us from home. And please, people who are home, don't expect anything fantastic from our technology. We're just happy that you can follow us, but we can't do more than that. <laughs> okay, stop share doesn't work. Let's try again. See? 
share. Perfecto. So now she's going to tell us her passionate research on Tom de Salvo. Oh no, where's it? I have to try this one. Okay, I'm not so good in technology, so uh, sorry about that. So, what about the salvo? This is very, very interesting because it's very different than what you used to see. Well, first, I got to know the salvo because of the last symposium uh, where uh, Domenica was doing work. And then I got fascinated about this painting because actually it's a puzzle. So what about this picture that's so different? Uh, first, because the sound it doesn't write here, you can see that the letters go around as a and they start to dig it, and then they are going to diminish it as they go to the middle. So uh, when you see that the uh, diagrams there, I thought, uh, wow, look like Japan, because the field is Japan, and Mount Fuji in the middle. So I thought, it might be Japan and Mount Fuji. And actually, I thought, wow, that uh, structure is not very Japanese architecture. But my friend told me, look, okay, there is an Akidot in Kyoto, call it the uh, Suitako, Su Rokako Akidu, that has exactly that shape. So, but I was not convinced because this is the Akidu, it's kind of red shape. The paint is yellowish. So I started to read, I started to look at the Metropolitan Museum catalog and I found that painting about uh, Kyoto. And it was a losango. And I was like, wow, two losango together. Uh, looks so familiar. And then I decided to put the painting of the cell as the field. And I figured out that each component, each piece, has a different text. Oh, sorry. So the first one uh, is to start from the bottom and goes to the top and goes to the spiral as I told you. And if we start to read the shape, it's going to snow, clouds over uh, the lost towers, and then things to be there. The second one is more intriguing because uh, it's inverted. You can see on top of the picture, uh, in the picture of the south, it starts from the right to the left. And it's kind of difficult to read it, so I inverted it, the image, and I was able to start to find the word. So uh, he says, don't you see? The Shantai LDCI. LDCI is, is a date in Roman numbers, but he put a special mark because he wrote wrong in January. The L is, a, is not there because the I should be the last word. So actually, it means L. Um, uh, C. C uh, L. I. So it should be. Uh, you see it would be 600, L would be 600, and I would be 1. So 651, uh, an undomini. Uh, so this was the year of the Tang dynasty in China. So what did he say? Don't you see? The Shanghai LDC. Today, in Shang policy exists not. I couldn't find, uh, there is another word maybe there, but I really couldn't read it. Then in, in the third quadrant, 
this one is it's interesting because I could read more words there. And the thing about the salvio, we use this um, stencil letter. So the stencil letters make you possible to like join one uh, letter to the other. Or for example, he can put the S just a part of the S. Or sometimes the T and H are together and form D. So it's very tricky. So I, I read that 10 times or more, and each time I found something different. But I concluded that the east ward slice the sea, west ward uh, light snow uh, on the distant hills up here. And again, I couldn't really read what to say. But yeah, sometimes you can't read all the words. So that's uh, the last button, uh, and you can see also it's inverted. I had to invert it, and be, so in the beginning, thinking B S B something. Uh, so then you realize that he starts the word one, and he finishes in another sentence. So in the beginning, you start to say, "Is it a B S or what is it?" So I realized that it's a beast. So. These are in the lair, these are in the toil, in the trap and the snares, then um, so the conclusion is that this is a young city in China that once was known as Trump City. And it's about the dumbing policy that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there is a new reconstruction, reconstruction that the Chinese did recently about the dumbing policy. So what is it? See, there is a pagoda called Shumi. So when he said clouds over the towers, and the also the towers there or the pagoda, we are not so sure about that. And I thought the image as a puzzle. And it was real orange is so you can see maybe the diamond can means a trap or a X can be the end. Anyone, I think it just this album can answer all these questions for us. And I use the concept app that uh, that's very good to write on the top, to, to change colors and to figure out things. And thank you, that's it. <laughs> If you want to spend your time trying to understand, it's a big challenge. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra, for taking up the challenge. Really, it's nice um, that you try to give an answer to many of these questions that probably we'll never know. Yeah, but in the meantime, we do enjoy uh, the Salvos paintings all around the university. And tonight we have the reception in an hour or so um, in front of one of his paintings in CU building upstairs, the living room theater the Bagheria painting. And now the third speaker for tonight is um, Mark Casanella, who, as you heard, drove all the way with his wife. Uh, thank you, Anne, for coming to, from New York. And uh, he's here to present Ralph Casanella's uh, painting, Images of Optimism from Immigration to U a Utopian Vision. And Mark asked me not to speak too much about him because he's going to present himself in a very funny uh, and interesting way, you will see. Okay, here you are. <laughs> okay, bravo. Uh, okay. I'm going 
Marco Fasanella. <laughs> um, and my, my real name is uh, Marco Antonio. I was named after an Italian American politician, Vito Marco Antonio, who ran for mayor in New York City. So that's another interesting Italian American story, but that's not why I'm here. So I wrote a book about my father called Images of Optimism. And uh, I'm kind of uniquely place to, to write about him because I have a PhD in art education uh, and I studied art history and I've also worked as a professional curator um, so I see him through two different lenses as a family member and then also uh, from an artistic lens but I've done a lot of things I've been an art director I've been a dishwasher a stonemason uh, and a few years back I quit my job as an academic so now I consider myself a lapsed academic um, and I'll get a bit to that as we go through the presentation. So I looked very different before the pandemic. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I really thought about who I was because I was no longer in an academic position. And I wasn't looking for a job, so to speak. I mean, I was at the very beginning, but I reached a point where I wasn't for a job, looking for a job. So I decided to kind of investigate, you know, what has now become a very common thing. People explain their positionality. What is it that they're bringing to their sense of identity, whether it's their gender or their uh, ethnic background, or you know, there are things that they're bringing to their. So of course, like all of us, there are a lot of people inside of me. And this is what I was for many years. I taught ecological design and I worked as an estate gardener. I've also been an activist and an armchair anti-fascist. Uh, I've also been a protector of the wildlife. I've been a yoga student. I've been Professor Peace, is this character's name? They all have names, and they're all going to go on my website. Now, this is Dr. Punk. Uh, I came up with these characters while I was teaching a course called Collective Action. Uh, I've been a gardener, um, and so that's Woody Miller. And I've also tried to be a peace activist. This is Tik Olam, uh, an artist of, of myself. I've done some artwork and taught art. So I see this as Shepard Haring, a street artist. And then when I was young, like many young people, I experimented with drugs. So this is Maxwell Microdose. And then this is a new movement that I'd like to make a peace pirate. So this is Moondog, the peace pirate. Uh, and I spent many years in the Hamptons art scene, going to very fancy benefits and things like this. So I had, and I had to have a different shirt. This is the first time I've worn a shirt in public for every time I was going to be photographed in society pages. And I was not in society pages because of who I am. I was in society pages because I was armed candy for someone else. Uh, and then this is what I've been most recently, is a, a very sad carpenter because nobody hires restoration carpenters anymore. And um, I'm here as this character, really, William London, who's kind of an academic, uh, who's trying to figure out who we are. And mostly what I'm working on now is a, a cottage that I'm restoring. So all of those things are what I am. I think more interesting than a biography that says I won this award or published this book. Um, those are aspects of who's in front of me. But I'm not here to talk about me. I'm here to talk about my father. Um, so my father was a self-taught painter. He um, was uh, incarcerated essentially in a Catholic protectory, and I'll explain that a little bit more, when he was very young. Uh, for uh, so he was actually kept there several times for different things, but the last time, the longest time, was because he took a car, probably at the age of nine or something like that, um, and that was something. And also truancy. Uh, so he grew up in a in a, a time where he wasn't expected to get an education or in a position where he expected to get an education, but he ended up being incredibly self-educated. He gave to me a, a love of books and learning. Uh, and this is what is on his tombstone. I don't think he came up with this phrase. I've seen it in other contexts. But remember who you are. Remember where you came from. Don't forget the past. Change the world. So he grew up with a very immigrant identity, even though he was the children of immigrants, because 
he, he was uh, born in Little Italy. And of course, what he would have heard was very much like uh, the experience in Christ in Concrete. If you haven't read that, it's a great book um, where he would have been hearing mostly Italian in the home. And he was in a neighborhood where everyone was speaking Italian. But basically, if you think about what an immigrant means, it simply means somebody who came from a country to live in, a, in another place, in, in a foreign country, and lived there permanently. Um, and my father had an interesting take on that, which I'll explain why. And really think about the phrase, make America great again. Uh, if you think about it, this is on the Statue of Liberty. Keep your ancient lands, your storied pomp, cry she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamps beside the golden door. So it was professed then when my grandparents uh, on my father's side came to the United States, but of course it was not always practiced. The term WAP has many meanings, but one of them is without papers. Um, and you meet a lot of Italian Americans say, well, my parents came here the right way. Um, not so much if you were to go back and look at the records <laughs> for many people, um, because they were very much in that context that was anti-immigrant. Um, so here you see the family in our, in our portrait, um, and you have all their names, Savino on the left, Nicolo, his brother, uh, Ginevra, uh, Teresa is the baby, Rafael, my father, Steffi, Bob, and Angelina. Angelina Lee actually was the most radical of all of them, um, but Ginevra and Giuseppe didn't last as a couple, despite having even another child after that, Tommaso. Uh, who's obviously not in the photograph, um, or maybe even conceived then. Giuseppe uh, had a very difficult time in New York City. He worked as an ice man, he had friends, and um, but it was hard work. And as you'll see, the times changed. This is a, a depiction of my grandfather Giuseppe in the atrium of a New York City tenement, crucified with the ice tongs uh, as his crown of thorns. And then my father depicting the staircases up the center. So you'd normally go up, the tenements of those days were generally five floors or less. Um, so you'd walk up with a 40 pound block of ice on your back with a leather strap over your shoulder to keep it uh, cold, you know, all day long and uh, working with a horse and wagon. And it's hard work. And this is really the depiction of the city that my father grew up with hearing from his father and even from his older brother. Now, this is a painting called High in the Sky, and you can see that uh, it really is a, you know, the, a very dark, dense place that they're living in, playing stickball down the street with the church at the back, uh, and you'll see why he depicted the church in such a dark way. And the rooftops, but above this envisioned idea of paradise, either in the afterlife or if you were able to move into a bigger part out of the tenement. Um, that was something that they really yearned for, but weren't sure if they would ever reach. And in my father's paintings, if you look closely, this says, like a breath of sunny morning, Shenley. And of course, the irony of it being on the side, a billboard on the side of a, uh, a very dark tenement alley is, is not uh, missed on my father. So this is a depiction of Giuseppe being um, crucified inside the icebox. And what's happening is he's being lowered from this tenement, and there's my father lowering his father inside the icebox. There's this cap, and there's lots of imagery, a cup of espresso. And he's being replaced by a refrigerator down here. And this is one of the older tenement buildings. You see newer buildings going up. This is the old country, Lavello, where he came from in Italy, just in between Bari and Naples. And then there is my father on a truck as opposed to the horse and wagon that's his father. So my father's depicted here, depicted here lowering his father on the truck, waiting for the kind of sarcophagus to come down. So you really see that uh, my father understood that Giuseppe was kind of crushed. He was crucified by his job and he was crushed by it. He actually went back to Lavello. And from what I, I understand from his relatives, who I met a few times, that he ended up having a, a decent life and a new girlfriend. Um, that he lived with, never had any other kids. Um, but my father grew up in this context of Little Italy when the San Gennaro Festival was not something that was kind of out of control, <laughs> which it can be. Although my daughter went the past year and said she had a great time. The last time I went, it was so gigantic and it was so many people you were afraid you were going to be crushed. Um, but this is the context he grew up in. It was a real 
celebration and flowering of um, Italian American culture. But he was incarcerated in the Catholic protectory. Uh, the Catholic protectory is where they sent truant and misbehaving youth uh, if they were Catholic. I actually worked for a short time at, at what later became a, a school for emotion disturbed kids who were taken by the state that had been a Jewish protector. If they were Jewish, they were sent there. And I worked there as a counselor. But it wasn't a nice place. Uh, he did say there were times when the brothers used the boys as women. That was the way he described it. Um, you see kids lined up over here, and they would have to stand this way all day doing penance um, while the other kids were playing. There are paintings of the protectory that are more joyful where there are kids playing, but this is something that he very much took. Uh, from his time in the Catholic protectory and his understanding of what the church um, could be. So this is that painting family supper that you've heard so beautifully described. There's the ice wagon, Joe's ice wagon. And on this bucket, it's a funny juxtaposition because as much as it's a painting in homage of my grandmother, Ginevra, who's both depicted here at the center of the table, and this is Ginevra crucified on the cross with thread because she was a seamstress. And you'll see where she worked. Uh, in a moment, but on this bucket, it says, in memory of my poor my father, Joe, poor bastard died broke, and to all Joes who died the same, broke. So that's what's written on this, this uh, here. And then these are stores that actually existed, some of them up until very recently in Little Italy that were selling only imported Italian goods. Little Italy has, has changed very much. Boston has remained much of its character uh, in, in New York City, it's very much become, Chinatown's expanded out into um, But the, some of the stores remain for many, many years. And that's the tenement that he lived in for many, many years. And there you see uh, his depiction in the 1950s, 1958, of my father, Giuseppe, after he left the United States. Um, kind of my father looking back at him. And you can see some of those same things, the, the smaller buildings, um, the old country kind of depicted over here on the side. Uh, my father raised pigeons, so you can see pigeons. Went up too high. You can see pigeons on the rooftop. When that thing goes away. <laughs> um, uh, but you really get the idea. Uh, my father felt that he got his understanding of painting and color from two different things: the stained glass windows and the Catholic protectory, and then also the way people organized. Because he worked with my father until he was about um, ten or eleven on the ice wagon and they would go into people's apartments and the apartments were clean in the tenements and they would take all the food out of the ice box put the ice in and then put all the food back and there was a way of kind of a respect and a system of order that you would use in, in uh, setting up the people's ice boxes and even looking at what they ate and how they kept their house he felt like he got a real education in that but then my grandmother ginevra she had the reason my grandfather Giuseppe left despite uh, overwork and technology changing, being replaced by refrigeration. He, uh, Ginevra, had an affair with an Italian um, labor organizer uh, uh, who was an anarchist and radicalized her. Uh, and my, they split up. And then my uh, grandmother Ginevra moved them to the Bronx, uh, the family to the Bronx. And this is what the Bronx was like. My daughter teaches in the Bronx, and it does not look like this now. Uh, it is very dense, but this is what was called a sandlot where the community would get together, the immigrants would get together, and they would take an unused lot, dig it out. Um, the parents would sew the uniforms for the kids, and they'd trade equipment, and they would play sandlot baseball, which was very different than playing stickball uh, in the tenements of New York City. So it really gave them a new sense of kind of space and a different understanding of the city that had all of that beauty and that sense of community, but also had a sense of space. I'm not sure if he was commuting at the time, but that's where both my father and my grandmother Jennifer worked. That's the Triangle Shirt Factory. Um, and that uh, shirt factory is now part of the, what well, is the place, site of the famous Triangle Shirt Fire where many immigrant women, nine Americans and others had to jump out of the windows because the fire exits were blocked. That same kind of uh, sweatshop still exists very much today. I saw it in uh, Brooklyn before Brooklyn became gentrified, but it certainly exists in Indonesia and other places where there are very similar um, factories. Uh, but she worked here as a uh, seamstress and a buttonhole maker, and my father worked for a time pressing uh, clothes. And uh, you can really see how his idea of having reached into, gone into all of these different interiors informed the way he saw a city or the world, he saw what was behind. We, I go navigate the world and I look at 
houses and buildings. We took a walk this morning around the neighborhood and I see the outsides of the house. He's the architect. He saw inside what was happening in his mind's eye. And uh, then, of course, tried to communicate with us. This is what um, happened after he volunteered to go fight in the Spanish Civil War. So he was working uh, after the Triangle Shirt Factory. He had an ice route. Um, and then he worked as a truck driver, part-time truck driver. And then because he was very close to his mother and his sister, Lee, at the time, and their politics and kind of radicalized, saying, you know, working people should be treated better. And if you read Christ in Concrete, you'll get a real explanation of, of a, a kind of cauldron. Um, but again, that still exists. Building collapses happen today all the time, and there are very often immigrant workers uh, in those buildings that collapse. My father went to the Spanish Civil War, and when he came back, uh, one of the guys who he became friends with while he was fighting against fascism in Spain, being a premature anti-fascist, one of the guys said, well, when you come back, I'm a machinist. Why don't you come get a job as a machinist apprentice, and I'll, I'll teach you how to be a machinist. He was a horrible machinist. Uh, he did not have a mind for that sense of decision, but he was an excellent talker, and he became a union organizer. And then this really, it's kind of amazing. It's 1957. It's kind of my father's most celebrated painting. It's a very large canvas. It's a triptych. It's made on uh, three sections. So it's probably about 10 feet across. Um, and uh, again, so many of those windows have little tiny scenes in it. But he felt he got this view of the city from riding the elevated trains. And kind of, again, in his mind's eye, seeing the entire city and the people that composed it and the communities they developed. If you live in New York, the people from, you know, uh, downtown don't go uptown. Like my daughter now lives in um, Washington Heights, and it's an incredibly vibrant ethnic community. And, you know, she does go downtown, but generally people from Washington Heights don't go downtown. People from downtown go uptown. It's, it's communities. They develop these neighborhoods and, and communities. And that's the way he saw, saw the city. He saw the beauty. Um, and he saw the, the beauty of each person within it. There's now an exhibit uh, that it will open on April 1st. It's in development right now at Fenimore Arts Museum in Cooperstown. And it's going to feature this painting. The normal home for this painting is in the New York City subway system. Uh, it's owned by the American Folk Art Museum, and it is at the subway station, which is right near the, Met the Museum of Modern Art in the city, the Third Street subway station. But you can really see how, you know, he, he identified with each person on that train and, and their lives and their exhaustion went away uh, home from work. But then uh, he, uh, when he met my mother in the 1950s, he ended up um, moving to Riverdale, New York. And my mother had grown up uh, for some time in Pennsylvania as a coal miner's daughter. She was of Czechoslovakian Ukrainian background, and she had that memory of being in the country. So when they lived in Riverdale, they could metaphorically, they were close to the country, they could take trips. Um, and he, this is his kind of depiction. It's not a view out of any particular window, although there's a twin to this painting, the woman who owned it just passed away, so I'm not going to watch for sure what's going to happen. It's actually a funny story I'll tell very quickly. My father gave this painting to this woman who was his brother-in-law's second wife, which is why Angelina, who you saw, I think had a falling out with my father because I don't think he liked that my father was hanging out with this. Uh, first, <laughs> with, with her uh, first husband's um, girlfriend. And so anyway, she owned this painting, this woman, Vivian D, and my father gave it to her. And my mother said, oh, no, 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 you don't. You can't give that painting away. It's too good of a painting. So my father painted a second one secretly and gave it to Vivian. So there's two of them. But uh, this is, so I had a good conversation with Vivian about the painting. So this is kind of depicting where they lived in Riverdale. But also what I love about it, it depicts the evolution of the city. From wood frame structures to the small tenement houses to more modern buildings that were going up in the Bronx. And then up to where, you know, in Westchester County in the suburbs that they have ended up living. Um, and these are the factories that he worked as an organizer in, in Westchester County. He worked in Anaconda, uh, made wire, was a wire company, and a company called Jerry's uh, Fireoscope that made um, things that were used in, in uh, warfare, uh, World War II. So, you know, those, these are, this really his, his depiction. This is the Hudson River. The Hudson River doesn't wind like this, but he's trying to show more than one part of the Hudson River all on one hand. So it's called inventive perspective. 
And this is the gas station that he came to run because he was blacklisted because of his having been involved in the Spanish Civil War. He actually went through a period where guys would follow him. And if he applied for a job, they'd walk in after him during the dark era and say, don't hire that guy. He's a red. Um, so he couldn't get a job. So his brothers gave him a job pumping gas at their gas stations. Uh, Nick and Sam both owned gas stations and then eventually saved up enough money and opened a gas station with his brother-in-law, Wynn, who was Lee's first husband, who was with Vivian. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, and and uh, he really enjoyed that community of the Bronx. It's called Happy and Bud. They bought the gas, the gas station with that name. Um, and he really enjoyed that that community. And I spent some time when I was a kid down there with them. And you could tell it was really like a fixture of the community. They used to barter all the time for people to get their car fixed. And then he got discovered um, in the 1970s. Uh, Milton Glaser is a very famous graphic designer who died recently. Uh, put him on the cover. He assigned Nicholas Pelleggi, um uh, to write an article about him. Nicholas Pelleggi wrote a book, an Italian-American um, kind of gangster book. Uh, what is it called? Uh, Pope of Greenwich Village, right? Is that? Uh, yeah, you guys guys also. And, yes, and, and Pope of Greenwich Village. Um, but anyway, so this was a, an article that he wrote early in his career about my father, and it, it gained a lot of attention for him and also wider recognition. And so that, this kind of became his life. This, this is the train station in Dobbs Ferry. Uh, he had met through one of his union friends, a guy named Dante Puzo, who was a PhD in history from the University of Chicago, who wrote two books on the Spanish Civil War, and they became very close friends. So when my mother was trying to get um, my father and, and two kids out of the city, uh, they moved to Do a town next to Dobbs Ferry, part because of this relationship. This is the train station in Dobbs Ferry. You can see the river again, and you can see the kind of sense of, of optimism and peacefulness um, that he is depicting in the painting, as opposed to those early paintings, Pie in the Sky. Right? Even the pie in the Pie in the Sky painting is still pretty dark and disturbed. And, uh, and it's also amazing if you think about those paintings from that first Iceman Crucified, which was the 1940s, late 1940s, and then by the 1950s, he was already painting that New York City painting. How quickly he taught himself how to paint without going to train. Um, and my mother took us on vacations in Maine, and you can also see their very kind of idyllic painting, this little cabin that we rented for eight weeks in Maine, which you can imagine for a kid like me was amazing. I had a little motorboat, and I tooled around that lake, and a very different life from this time growing up in, in uh, Penman House, literally. It's Camden, Maine, where he we went. But despite having, and those paintings are depicted in that book, uh, Images of Optimism, because there's two other books about my father, one called Fastinelli City by Patrick Watson, which was written in 1972, right around the same time that article came out. Patrick Watson saw it and said, oh, who's this guy? Patrick Watson at the time was the head of the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Um, so he had quite a big following. My father also was very aware of what was going wrong in the world. And I didn't show you those images. There's an online exhibit that we've extended, uh, partially because of this talk, at a website that I'll give you a minute, called fastnella.org. Um, and that online exhibit depicts his paintings, and they're in the beginning of that book, of the images of optimism. His paintings that really show the, the trauma of American society. But partially because we were living such an idyllic life, my father had a very conflicted um, existential angst, uh, as you can see from my pre-pandemic, post-pandemic pictures, right? He was dealing with this existential angst. This is actually depicting um, Julius Rosenberg, but depicting him as if he would, would have been alive and was executed um, for uh, ostensibly being a spy for Russia um, by the, uh, during a time of anti-Semitism by the American government. They were executed, uh, Julius Nestle Rosenberg. Um, and there's uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman up at the top. So this is Julius Rosenberg, metaphorically sitting in the midst of the 1980s when Reagan was president, trying to make sense of all while having a cup of coffee. <laughs> and of course, he's a stand-in for my father's. He's an alter ego, like I showed for my father's psyche. And we went back to visit the gas station that my father um, lived in. And there's a great painting of that depicted in the book or gas station playground, but this is a painting that did at the same time called It's a Fun City. Um, and there's all kinds of funny little things like this is a can of, of Warhol's farting beans down here, making fun of Andy Warhol. But, um, and these are all the, the nicknames from, of my friends from high school, rat, whatever. 
but uh, he's really showing, you know, there was a period where Ford said the city dropped dead and Fort Apache, the Bronx, which I witnessed, but it was really a very conflicting time for him. Um, and I think in those images, he captured that this fellow, Glenn Siegel, has captured in more recent photographs. These are 2014 photographs of everyday Americans surrounded by seven days worth of their trash. Because my father really realized how much of a consumerist oriented society we were becoming. This image I find the most disturbing because I have two 20 year old kids and uh, my son in particular, they, you know, they, they uh, live a life where they're surrounded constantly by processed food, and pack, over, overly packaged food. My daughter living in Washington Heights, there's people selling handmade stuff in the streets illegally out of pools. <laughs> so it's a different context. So I think my father ultimately had this notion of, of holding on to the cultural identity and the cohesiveness of the city, but also holding on to the space and the light and the air and the sense of beauty that you could have in a, in a this is a, a painting difficult old neighborhood, um, which is, he never lived in a place like this, but kind of an idealized version of what that neighborhood in the Bronx might have been. And I'm reading a book right now about a flood in 1903 in a place called Hefner, uh, Oregon, and it very much sounds exactly like this kind of streetscape before this, this calamitous flood happened, which is the same kinds of exact kinds of consequences have happened in so many floods and are happening right now because we tend to create communities where it will flood. <laughs> but um, if you're interested in reproductions other than the ones that are on sale for the scholarship, they are available at museums.co. Um, the gallery that represents my father, if you're interested in his work, is in Michigan. Um, in Birmingham, Michigan. It's a fantastic gallery run by Tim and Pam down the hill. As I said, that exhibit is online right now that shows all of his kind of dystopian paintings, um, not the images of optimism in the book. That's my father and my mother, who I wouldn't be here without. Um, and Fastinella.org uh, has lots of information about uh, my father. I would not be here also if it was not for Eladia and Domenica, because they both reached out to me and told me about this fantastic symposium. My, uh, what I would like on my tombstone, except I would rather not be buried, uh, is remember the past, understand the present, envision the future. If you want to know more about me, you can. Thank you. Very nice presentations, all of them. We have learned a lot about uh, uh, these painters and anybody now who has questions for our three speakers, uh, do you want to come here? So maybe you can speak on the microphone. Um, I have one question in regards to genre. What genre do they belong to? Can you tell us? Primitive, primitive, what? Both of them actually. Uh, can you come here so they can hear you in case? Kind of controversial because uh, he hated the word naive or primitive, which they're, they're early on they called him a naive, a primitive, or a folk artist. And the, on that, that magazine, it said the best um, primitive painter or folk painter since Grandma Moses. And most of those people do not paint the political context of their times. Uh, so I like the term self-taught social realist, although I've gotten pushback on social realist because he did more than that. He wasn't only depicting that and he was not schooled and he wasn't part of that crowd. So he kind of fits into a lot of different ones. There's also a phrase outsider art, which is people who are trained outside of the art world. They, they're not part of the fine art world very often. They're not aware of it. My father was very aware of the art world and spent a lot of time in museums and reading books about artists and politics. So it's hard to pe peg him. <laughs> Sadly has a question about Domenica. Where is Domenica? Okay. <laughs> what do you think of the genre of uh, the style boys? And then I would actually just echo exactly what Marcus said because he was a self-taught painter. He was extremely um, educated and academically focused and therefore it is not appropriate to pigeonhole him in any of the genres, but he was indeed a self-taught painter. So, hey, Kali. But I'm not sorry. Va bene. It's okay. I'll translate. Yes, yes.
Oh. That's a good comment. She says that uh, it was interesting for her to see uh, the images that gave a face to her fa own father's childhood and growing up in an immigrant neighborhood. And in little Italy, exactly. So, okay, any other question or comment? Yes. For the most part, it's the only place working class people can live now because the prices have become so expensive in every other part of New York City. There are a few working class enclaves in Queens and very few in, the, in Brooklyn, but people have been pushed into the Bronx. That's the only place. I always ask cab drivers and waiters and waitresses, where do you live? And they always say the Bronx. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Yes. Oh, the chat. I don't know. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Rishi is really that you are offering them for a scholarship. I think this is the the forward thinking instead of. Uh, uh gaining back the money you spent by publishing them you're just giving them forward and have other people study your father and uh, and go on with the uh, i guess with this tradition and this uh, uh culture and in fact sandra in, for you it was really interesting to see how you entered into from this cycle. even if you're not a student of ours or you're not a scholar of uh, art you were just uh, curious to know uh about him any other uh, comments or questions? Yes. Yes. <laughs> In fact, we read the uh, uh, pricing concrete, and it's the perfect companion. Uh, uh, this beautiful novel. Yes. One question there. Oh, why did Tom DeSalvo use Japan? The salvo is very eclectic. eclectic. You find everything in his painting, and you can go on and on for hours. Yeah. In fact, I was thinking maybe another thing that puts them in common, as in common, they have in common, is how they engage the, the audience, too, the viewers. You have many questions, and they, if you look at everything, you find a story in every little corner. It's like a conversation with, uh, with somebody. And uh, that's maybe, I don't know if they're conversation paintings. <laughs> and some of the disciples are just huge questions. So you can join them and say, what do you mean? What is that letter? And then you read and you go close and try to understand. Yeah, so we'll have all an exercise in uh, some disciples deciphering. Now we're all going to see the, the paintings, the Kandinsky Chronicles. So if you want to follow Domenica, are on the left going out. And they are right there in the main hall of the next building. And then everybody is invited to the second floor of the living room theater where we have a reception in, under his Bagheria painting, which is a Sicilian painting by Tom DiSalvo. 
And anybody for the books, uh, there is a box there. We go with the honor system uh, and it's $20. Just put them there and take a book. And thank you all for coming for to this beautiful session. And thank you to the speakers. Goodbye. <laughs>